All right, I think it's a good time to get started. So uh, welcome to session two, and uh, welcome if you're coming back or if this is your first time here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, I want to make sure that everybody is comfortable with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, I've created this really short cheat sheet, so I'm going to pass this around. This just comes with the very handy keyboard shortcuts for moving around, so this will just make your life easier, not have to click on everything. And of course, uh, you know, this is open dialogue. If there are any questions, you know, I don't want anybody to get stuck or anything. And, you know, I actually prefer it if people talk to me. So don't worry about interrupting. Just go ahead and ask. And uh, once again, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, the LLNL Engineering Director, the Center for Advanced Signal and Image Sciences, also known as CASIS, as well as the IEEE East Bay Chapter, Signal Processing Society. I think this will actually work better not in presentation mode. Okay, so first thing, uh, hopefully everybody knows about the GitHub page. Uh, if not, this is somewhere you want to navigate to. I've uploaded a new notebook uh, for today's session, the case is open CV course session two.ipython notebook. Uh, you can get this if you know how to use Git, you can use that, or this is the easiest way for uh, newcomers. You can go to clone or download and download zip and get everything. And uh, so make sure you have this. And I've also added uh, two new files to the data directory uh, that we're going to use uh, in today's examples. So make sure you get all of that and you're all up to date on that. So today uh, we're going to do a little bit of a refresher on uh, NumPy and make sure that we understand exactly what's going on with our images and how to work with them and do all the essential operations, uh, which is useful in and of itself and it will be uh, you know, even more useful when we do uh, you know, image filtering and you know, advanced things like features and video analysis later. All right, so remember our uh, two utility commands from last time. You know, we're going to assume that in your kernel you've executed these. Actually, there was one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, some people had a problem last time when we did OpenCV Windows. Uh, if you were on a non-Windows machine like Mac or Linux, uh, you might have had problems. Like you can create the windows but not close them. So uh, this right here is from uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, this contains... Uh, some, I guess you would call them corrections, or some just uh, things that actually help you get it, the GUI stuff working under Max. So the difference here is in uh, these two lines right here. Uh, so instead of just going straight to cv2.imshow, you'll go uh, cv2.named window, so forth, you know, with the window name, and I think uh, this one can be done automatically. And you want to call cv2.start window thread. So, uh, Stack Overflow, as I mentioned last time, is a great resource if you are having trouble with OpenCV and or Python or just about anything programming related. But uh, just about everything we're going to do today is going to be within the notebook, so this should not be too big of a deal, but uh, this is important uh, if you do want to you know, just create standalone applications later. So okay, let's make sure that uh, you know, we're in uh, so in the notebook, make sure that you've imported CV2. This is the OpenCV library. And that you have uh, called the PyLab notebook so that we have access to all of our NumPy features and our plotting features and so forth. And uh, you know, I've just included a couple extra instructions in case you do want to use Python from the command line. Uh, or you want to use uh, IPython, which is just the command line version of this. There's also uh, Python's inbuilt interpreter, but that's it's a little bit painful to use, so uh, IPython will definitely make your life a lot easier. Showing how to call that. Just IPython from bash or cmd.exe, so forth. Then make sure you execute similar commands, like import cv2. Uh, this has like up completion. So I can uh, actually uh, do commands that I called from the last session. Okay, moving on, uh, make sure that, uh, so hopefully everybody's downloaded and is up to date on the Git repository. So you have the latest data files and so forth. 
So make sure you change directory to the data directory, which contains all of our image files that we're going to be using today. So, you know, this is just an example. Yours is going to be different. Make sure I have executed that. All right, so let's get started manipulating pictures. So we're going to use the butterfly.jpg picture that is included. Uh, you also mentioned to take advantage of uh, tab completion. You know, you don't have to type this in all the time. So I am read, and this works on files too. So just want to put that out there. It'll make your life easier. And we're going to display most of everything today using matplotlibs. Uh, I am show utility. So, you know, we create a figure, make sure that we're generating a new image, otherwise you might be pointing to a previously created image, which may or may not be what you want, but in this case we definitely want to create a new one. We press shift enter, and then we get our figure with our interactive axes and so forth, and we can see the color image of the butterfly. Of course, uh, a lot of what we do, especially uh, scientific applications, but in vision in general, a lot of algorithms work on grayscale images. So make sure you're familiar with this function right here, cv2.cvtcolor, and then uh, you know, your input image, and then the color code. And remember tab completion. Now you can get just about every code you want. It all reduces to a single number anyway, but this makes for readability. I think cv2.color bg BGR to gray, uh, I think it's the number four, but it's nice to write it out so it makes for readability if somebody's reading your code later. So let's display a grayscale image. So this uh, does a color map by default. It's a color image, uh, which is useful for some things, not so useful for other things. Uh, we can add the color bar in too if you want to see uh, the range that's in here. So whether or not you want the false color or rainbow color, that depends on you, but oftentimes we do just want the grayscale. So I am show by itself defaults to the color map, the rainbow scale. But if we do this instead, I am show, we're putting in the grayscale image, and then C map equals gray, gray in quotation marks. Execute that, then we've got a grayscale image. And also this command is often helpful color bar so we can see the scale on the side of it. All right, we covered this a bit last time, but we want to make sure that we understand our image dimensions, what exactly we're working with. So remember that the way to do that is to have uh, the name of your NumPy array. Everything here is a NumPy array dot shape. So bfly dot shape, bfly gray dot shape. So for the color image, you see the Y dimension, the X dimension, and the color dimension. But for the grayscale, it only does uh, you know, Y dimension and X dimension. So if the last one is a singleton, uh, it's going to uh, just drop that last term. Um, so we see RGB here and gray here, but uh, although we're not really going to be doing it in this class, uh, sometimes you could have number of channels equals four which happens when you have, for example, an alpha channel, which is a transparency channel. Uh, tells you, you know, it could be opaque, could be transparent, which, uh, you know, it's useful for overlaying and blending images together. So you should be aware of that. And let's remember how to get the data type. So do bfly or image.dtype. This tells us that we have unsigned 8-bit, so 0 to 255 integers, which is uh, common when you're working with uh, normal cameras. But of course, when you do scientific analysis, oftentimes you do want floating point. So typically double precision, you know, most people have 64-bit machines anyway these days, so it, uh, it's just as efficient. So if we want to do that, uh, we take the grayscale image and then this dot as type here, uh, you know, you can put in any of the valid data types. So in this case, double, which is a float 64 then usually you want then the zero to two fifty or zero to one range rather than zero to two fifty five. If we're gonna do Fourier analysis and so forth. So we divide this by floating point to two fifty five point zero. Then see the D type of that, you know, double float sixty four, Python they're the same thing. Uh, very often you're gonna need the dimensions of your image, so here's just a handy command uh, in order to get those out. Remember that uh, 
Python, NumPy, it's just like MATLAB in that it puts the Y dimension first. So, you know, intuitively you might do like width comma height equals your image dot shape, but remember the height comes first. So uh, you can do this in one uh, command. So the zero to two, this is uh, how we do Python indexing. Uh, you might think zero to two does like zero, one, two, but it doesn't, it just does zero and one. Now Python uses a zero to n minus one convention by default. So uh, it takes a bit of getting used to, but uh, definitely handy. I mean, once you do get used to it, uh, this actually will save effort in the end. But just to remember this, so I'm gonna call uh, you know, this a range function, which uh, this is kind of similar to, uh, you know, in MATLAB, this would be like one to five, or in this case, it would actually be zero to four. But uh, you know, instead of doing one, two, three, four, five, it does zero, one, two, three, four. This is assumed that you're going to do indexing with this. So just keep it in mind, uh, just oftentimes trips people up if you're coming from something like MATLAB. Then if you want to be even more fancy, uh, you can actually drop the indices at the beginning or the end. So if you do this, it's just assumed that on the left here, you have a zero. So um, this is just shorthand for the same thing. So uh, height width equals uh, you know, shape, you know, colon two in the uh, bracket. So it's just zero and one. So execute this, execute this. We get the same thing as before. And uh, if you just wanna leave something, if you wanna get all of them, you can just use the colon and then it's understood that uh, you're retrieving all of the dimensions. Everybody's very quiet. I mean, quiet, I'm assuming that everybody's following and you know, we're all happy. See a few nods and a few smiles, all right. Okay, and to access the last element, you know, MATLAB has the end operator but in Python, you actually use negative numbers. So if I want to access this three here, uh, it's shape, and then in brackets, negative one accesses the last element, negative two, the second to last, negative three, the third to last, which in this case is the, fourth el uh, the first element. All right, so probably by this point, you know, it should be pretty intuitive how to uh, go from RGB to just us uh, uh, channels in uh, just single uh, single uh, channel. So we want RGB in separate variables. So remember the colon will extract everything of that dimension. So we get the Y dimension, the X dimension, and then s s since we're in RGB format, zero will access R, one will access green, and uh, two will access blue. And these will all be uh, singleton in the last dimension, even if you're accessing you know, the, the second or third element there. Then recombining them. Uh, so first you're gonna wanna create uh, a blank image. So we use the zeros function, similar to MATLAB, although you have to keep in mind that uh, when you pass the dimensions, uh, this is all kind of one parameter, which is a tuple. You know, it's a collection of variables. So, uh, you know, if you leave out these parentheses here, you are going to get an error. So uh, make sure you get the height, the width, and then if it's uh, something other than uh, a grayscale image, then make sure you put in the number of channels. So RGB, once again, we're three, and we're dealing with unsigned 8-bit, and then you can do the assignments uh, just as you would expect. Execute the code, and we get our butterfly. How did that go there? No, oh, I must have executed something already. Anyway, uh, extracting a region of interest. So we can see here, uh, you know, if we did want to zoom on, oh, this is going to bug me. Sorry about that, I was getting ahead here. I'd executed some. Yeah, that was coming later. I must have executed something a little bit earlier. Truth be told, I'm a tad confused, but I don't want to hold it up. But anyway, just pretend that that's the butterfly with its head intact. 
But uh, we can zoom in here, get the X and Y axes, and then uh, if we want to extract out that region around, you know, we want to do operations on that or we want to use that region later, uh, we just do the indexing you know, very similar to MATLAB, uh, you know, Y1 to Y2, X1 to X2, and then we get out uh, that region. In this case, we called it a variable B fly head, then we can display that. And this is the part where it's supposed to do the blackout. So uh, in this case, we write to that same region we write zeros, so I left out the last channel here, but that's going to write to all three channels, the red, the green, and the blue, and uh, write black there. So we do the figure, and we display that, and we can see that we're kind of censoring the butterfly's head here. But uh, you can see how easy it is to extract pixels and to write, read and write to pixels. So I've spread um, a few, yeah. So just, I know. <clears throat> do we have the microphone? Awesome, right next to you. Okay. So I just, um, maybe it's worth saying that it's, uh, if you have the interpolation equals none, then you don't get the, then the, blutter, the butterfly head mm -hmm. zoom image will actually show the pixelization. Yeah, um, that's true. There are different uh, interpolation methods if you're going to show it. So I just left it as none, which is the default. But uh, you know, there's nearest neighbor interpolation, there's uh, linear interpolation, there's cubic interpolation, uh, depending on what exactly you want. But uh, here, I think it's nearest, na nearest neighbor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, throughout the notebooks, I put a few exercises that uh, if you want to do offline, you know, I recommend it just to test your knowledge. So uh, two exercises here. Uh, this first one's easy. Just uh, I suggest uh, trying to make a big plus sign over it. Just write two rectangles to it. Uh, the second one is probably just a little bit more difficult, but can probably be done in a few minutes. Um, the goal is to create a function that will take in two images of whatever size and then combine them into a larger side-by-side -side image. Uh, very useful for uh, analyzing images and comparing images and so forth. So I left a lot of blanks here. Uh, if you're to do this exercise, you know, you fill that in. Won't work as is, but um, you know, here's a starting point. And uh, yeah, if you're new to Python, uh, I want to make a point to pay attention to the indentation. Like if you do this, that's not going to work. You know, this expects. Uh, yeah, this is a block of code right here. So this expects uh, indentation uh, on each line that's part of the function. And once you go back here, this is, uh, you know, this x equals 2 is no longer part of the function. So uh, indentations have uh, meaning here. And uh, so just out of curiosity, anybody watch the show Silicon Valley here? Watch the show Silicon Valley. Everybody remember that episode where Richard was dating the Facebook programmer and you know, he like yelled at her for, you know, using spaces. But Richard's wrong. Okay, so he's obviously not a Python programmer because <laughs> Python, it's convention, we do use spaces. So like, if I go here, I hit the tab key, you know, it puts in the spaces here. Those are not tab characters. So um, I think it's called like PEP8 standard or something like that. Python code is just, it's like that because indentations are so important and tabs can cause confusion. and so spaces are good, you know. It's uh, my two cents and like the two cents of uh, most Python programmers. And uh, yeah, there was one point in the episode where like she hit the space bar over and over again, which does not make sense because most editors, you hit the tab and then it generates spaces over and So anyway, uh, and also Vim is better than Emacs. So that's the last <laughs> thing I'm gonna say about that. But pay attention to indentation, that's the moral of the story. Okay, so let's learn how to add images together, basically do general image arithmetic. So uh, what you have to keep in mind is like, uh, you might be tempted to use uh, NumPy's built-in addition and subtraction, their arithmetic operations. Uh, that could cause problems because uh, NumPy actually does uh, modular arithmetic by default. So, like, if you added two images, let's say you had a pixel that was, like, at 250, and then a pixel at 10, and then you added them together, 
you know, what do you th think you're going to get? So remember, we're dealing with unsigned 8-bit, so we're in the 0 to 255 range, so 260 is not possible. So when you're adding them together, you know, you probably want to clamp it, but it does modular arithmetic, so 250 plus 10 equals 4. So that's probably not what you want to do uh, when you're doing uh, image analysis. So a better way is to use OpenCV's uh, arithmetic operations. So CV2 has uh, a method called add. So if X and Y are the same dimensions, uh, why did it go down? Anyway. So in this case, uh, W, which is the output of this, this is the value 255. It's 10 plus 250, it's going to clamp it instead. So uh, you have to be very careful when adding and subtracting images anyway, but generally clamping is uh, what you're going to want to do. And similarly for subtraction, it will clamp it at zero. So uh, this is going to be a much more robust way of uh, doing uh, arithmetic operation. Uh, adding and subtraction anyway. But a uh, more general way, you know, generally you want to blend something together and you want to have some sort of weighted average. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think I ever actually use add or subtract. If I were to blend two images together, I would always use this add weighted function. So we're going to load uh, two pictures that came from uh, the OpenCV repository, pick one and pick two. These have the same dimensions. And uh, what we're going to do here is uh, do a weighted average where we're going to take 70% of the first image, this right here, and add it to 30% of the second image, which is uh, this image here, and then add them together. And we can see uh, all three of them uh, plotted against each other. And that's getting crammed in. What's the last zero for in that function? What is the last zero for? Well, this is an opportunity to remind you, we've got tab completion. So that is a gamma correction. So if you know what gamma is, it's a nonlinear correction term. So uh, I typically just set it to zero because we don't want to do that kind of correction. But uh, that is there if you want to use it. But yeah, I mean, this can do, you know, let's say we want to do image subtraction instead and subtract out 30%. That will work out just the same, and we get a negative of this image added to uh, the positive of the first image. So uh, this is definitely worth uh, noting and remembering if you want to do uh, image combinations. And incidentally, uh, this shows you how to do uh, subplots. It's a lot like MATLAB. So if you want to display images side by side within your notebook, uh, this is a good way to do it. Any other questions so far? Really yep. Tab Actually, the yeah, the microphone. Is it working? Uh, where did you put your tab after the line you typed in with the CV2 dot added weighted in order to get the um, prototype to show up? Oh, you can do it at any point. So if I just do cv2.tab, this gives me every I, single I got thing that that's part, in there. Yeah. So if you do that, that should be pretty distinct. Yeah. Oh, so once that's completely typed in, then it is, I did put that, I did not. Anyway, it's a shift tab. Shift tab. Okay, and that will make you. this come up. Alternatively, uh, you can also cell above. Oops. I use the A button to create a cell above. CB2. Put the question mark afterwards. Execute that cell. And then that's going to bring up uh, this on the bottom. That's going to show your prototype. So uh, OpenCV, most of the functions, they just kind of have the prototype mentioned there. NumPy is actually very well documented. You'll actually get a long length of uh, documentation for that. You can also put the function in help. So What's that? Help, type help, and then put, uh, put that function inside. And I think that's a magic command. 
I always use the, uh, where's the microphone? Oh, I was just saying that if you type, and so in Python, if you type help parentheses and then you put in the function, it usually should return the document string. Oh, that does work too. I learned something new. I always just use the question marks anyway. Sure. So thank you for that. All right, so we're going to move on to more of the fun stuff. We're going to talk about image filtering. So, uh, you know, doing a lot of preliminary stuff. Thank you for sticking with that. So um, we're going to start off with the simple low-pass filtering, which is just for each pixel, we're going to do some sort of average or weighted average of the pixels in the nearby region. Uh, this can be for noise removal. This can be, you know, feature removal, or if you're going to downsample or so forth. Uh, these are uh, very, very useful utilities. So, of course, uh, one of the simplest ones is just the Gaussian blur. So what you have here, CV, okay, we're going to read the baboon image in. That's uh, part of the CV repository. So the baboon blur image equals CV2.Gaussian blur. So the first parameter here is your image. Second parameters here, these are your sigma x and sigma y. Uh, make sure you have your X and Y straight because Python does Y first and X first, but uh, actually in this case, it's uh, Sigma X, Sigma Y first. So uh, just a gotcha there. And then this last parameter, actually, I'm sorry, uh, these are the kernel sizes. These aren't uh, the sigmas. Uh, in this case, uh, the Sigma zero, it's not actually Sigma zero, but it just means it's going to be uh, determined by uh, the size of your kernel. So it's going to have a Gaussian and it's going to drop off to nearly zero towards the ends. So uh, that's just handy, but you can specify uh, whatever uh, sigma size that you want for that. And also very simple filter is the custom, uh, we're going to do a custom kernel, which in this case is just going to be a simple boxcar. So we just have a square of ones although uh, we don't actually want ones to do that because otherwise you're going to scale the image. So you start off with ones, but then you're going to normalize to your kernel size. So question. Uh, can you give a brief description of like conceptual of what they mean by kernel? Kernel? Okay, so um, are you familiar with the concept of convolution? Uh, a little bit. Not okay, much. no problem. Um, so all right, I'm just going to use my hands here because I don't have a demonstration good to go. But what happens is you're going to, when you do filtering, when you do uh, convolution, is you're going to take like a, you have your big image and then you have your small image. Uh, your small image could be flat or it could be a Gaussian or it could be any number of things. And you're going to kind of slide that against your image. And for each point, you're going to do a multiplication point by point, And then you're going to sum up all of those and then you're going to replace the pixel in the center of that. Mm -hmm. Now, you have your kernel, you have the center pixel, mm -hmm. you do the summation, and then you're going to put that, and you're going to make that the replacement. So if we have a flat image, you know, we're going to just add up all of the pixels in a neighborhood of you know, the current pixel of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to divide by the number of pixels in there because we don't want to just do a raw, you know, we want to do a scaled average. You know, a mean, not just a raw sum. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to kind of blur it out. Every pixel is going to be some sort of weighted average of the neighboring pixels around it. In this case, it will be a flat average. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a very general uh, concept. You know, depending on the kernel, you can do any number of things. You can do uh, you know, weighted averaging, or you can do like high pass filtering if you have like negative you know, to strong pixels. You, know, you get something that's proportional to the difference of it. We're going to talk a little bit about high-pass filtering uh, shortly. So uh, this uh, kernel.size, size, uh, unlike shape, which gives you the individual dimensions of your image, size is going to give you the total number of pixels. So you know we did uh, ones, 15, 15. So size is going to be 15 times 15, so 225, the total number of pixels, since we don't want to scale our image. So kernel is going to be you know, 1 over uh, 225 in a 15 by 15 grid. That makes sense? 
Okay, so filter 2D is uh, performing that convolution operation that I was talking about right there. So what is that negative one that's in the middle? Filter 2D, negative one is D depth. I forget what that is off the top of my head, but negative one I think just uh, makes it the default value. So we do filter 2D, so we're going to filter the baboon image versus that boxcar filter. Then we're going to display all of that right here. Let's scale this up so the numbers aren't clobbering each other. So we can see the original image of the baboon. Actually, is that clear from all the way back there? Can you guys see that that's blurred? So actually, let's do something a little fun. Let's make this... Uh, a lot more blurry. You want those to be, uh, you want these to be numbers so you get symmetry. Well, it's not a good idea to code in front of people. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so baboon, I'm seeing blur here. Zero here. So please learn from my mistakes. There we go. Now we have it really blurred. <coughs> so um, the Gaussian blur is less blurred because the sigma size is actually smaller than 99. But uh, you get the idea here. So useful utility functions. So uh, I'm going to talk about something that I use a lot in uh, the course of my work, which is uh, median blurring, which uh, is an edge-preserving filter. So we're going uh, I think this is uh, most easily explained uh, in the one-dimensional case, but we will apply this towards an image. So we're going to learn a little bit about NumPy and the plotting functions. So uh, very similar to MATLAB, we're going to create a linearly spaced uh, vector of points ranging from negative 1 to 1 with 1,000 points. Then we're going to create a super Gaussian function, uh, 20th order, which is just, uh, it's, uh, it does, instead of having a round shape, it's somewhat rounded, but it kind of has an abrupt transition and becomes flat, which uh, you, know, you can see from this plot below. Then we're going to add some uh, random Gaussian noise to it. Uh, we want to make sure to clamp it at zero, and uh, we're going to convert this to uh, unsigned 8-bit because the median blur, unlike the Gaussian blur, can only operate on uh, quantized uh, integer values. Uh, does not accept uh, floating point values in because uh, median is kind of hard to define for that case. So we've got our x vector, we've got our y vector, we've got our noise vector, and then we're going to see, you know, I want to compare this to Gaussian blur. Uh, with this kernel versus the median blur. And uh, what's useful to see here, so we have our original and our original with noise, so we have kind of this abrupt transition, this kind of uh, square pulse with the noise on top. But we do the Gaussian blur, you can see that the edges are kind of smoothed off. So yes, you do eliminate the noise at the top, but uh, we're kind of losing features at the side. So, you know, if you have an image that has abrupt features, you know, you're taking a picture of some planar object or something like that, and you just do a Gaussian blur, you're going to smooth the edges, and that's often uh, not what you want. But with the median blur, this actually has a tendency to uh, preserve those edges. So it only does the small scale uh, features, but uh, if there's an abrupt change just by the nature of the median, you know, Assume everybody kind of remembers what that is. You know, you have your range of values and you look for the one in the middle. Uh, it's actually going to preserve the abrupt edges. So let's uh, 
let's zoom in on the top here so we can see the cyan one is the median blur. We can see just how nice and smooth that is and still preserves uh, the edges here. So, uh, you know, median blur is a nonlinear filter. Uh, it's a little bit slower to use, so I wouldn't say median blur is always better than Gaussian blur, but uh, it is often useful for edge preservation and, uh, for example, you know, kind of the ideal kind of noise that it removes is uh, salt and pepper noise, where, you know, let's say you have a black image and you have like, you know, white pixels scattered here and there, which, you know, happens a lot with uh, digital cameras. You know, a Gaussian blur is just kind of spread the energy out, whereas a median blur will just knock it completely out. So uh, good to know. And uh, incidentally here, uh, uh, this kind of shows that uh, you know, OpenCV's features can actually be useful for one-dimensional arrays. It's not strictly for image processing, but uh, you know, sometimes it is actually applicable to things like time series or you know, spectral data or any other kind of one-dimensional uh, uh, one signal. So just something to keep in mind in case it's useful. So um, this isn't so scientific, but I think uh, this is a nice way to show it. You know, we're going to use a medium blur to kind of cartoonify a real image. So uh, make sure you get the tulips image. Uh, this was not in the original uh, Git repository that I had up, but I put it on uh, just earlier today. So we get this image right here of the tulips. And then we're going to apply the median blur. And uh, I also did this so it puts in black edges at the transitions. We're going to talk about uh, canny edge detection in just a little bit, as well as morphological operations. So don't worry if you don't understand this block of code just yet. And we're going to display them side by side. So you can kind of see that we have this original image, and then we have a cartoonified version of it. So it just kind of helps see, you know, you have the smooth transitions here, and then it becomes kind of abrupt cartoony transitions here. So um, hopefully that kind of uh, you know, illustrates what exactly the median blur does. Whereas a Gaussian blur would just, you know, it would make it smooth, but you'd still have, uh, you know, it wouldn't be the abrupt transition so much. So I didn't think we were going to have time to cover this. So I'm going to recommend that uh, everybody look into uh, it's called non-local means filtering, which is a very powerful uh, noise reduction technique that uses statistics based on patches of the images to estimate noise. And uh, it's a bit slow to use, but it actually does a very, very good job in removing the noise. So uh, I've included the link here to uh, the non-local means tutorial on uh, docs.opencv.org. All right, any questions? Okay, so that's, did you download the Git repository from before, from Monday? No, I just did it. Yeah, it's not the one from Monday. That should have been there. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't understand why that did not put it up there. Sorry about that. I'm not the biggest expert on Git. Okay, so now the images are there. So, um, yeah, the two new images that are up there are the tulips.jpg and there's a sudoku image, sudoku big.jpg. So uh, however you want to update it, you can just download those two files or use uh, Git or however you want to do it. So which directory did you 
Yeah. The data directory. You don't see, bear in mind it sorts yeah, by so upper and lower case. You should nice. be able to just navigate there and uh, right click it. So this, this mm -hmm. Oh, it's a capital, it's a, it might be sorted uh, capitals first, so it may not be at the bottom. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I always hate that. Yeah, make sure to watch out for oh, yeah. capital, yeah. lower case. That's weird. That would be more intuitive. Probably do it the other way because capitalizing a file is not like automatic for most people. Mm -hmm. Well, programmers anyway. So maybe if you capitalize it, that means it's something different. That's so, true. So maybe that's their rationale. So everybody's uh, found the new images okay? Okay, I think we can resume. Good to go. Okay. So, yeah, sorry about that, but now the images are actually online. And yes, you do want that, uh, the Tulips image and the Sudoku image. We're going to use that uh, momentarily. So that was low pass filtering. So on the other end, uh, there's high pass filtering, which is uh, often used for edge detection. But the gist of high pass filtering is that uh, it responds to derivatives of images or uh, changes in the spatial variation, you know, spatial variations. So if there's an abrupt change from like one level to another, a high pass image is going to have a strong value there. And if you have like constant values, then it's going to have a low value there. So uh, we're going to use uh, the Sudoku image to show this. So um, there are various ways of doing it, but uh, you know the Laplacian filter, which is kind of a second derivative of the image, is a powerful high-pass filter, as well as uh, Sobel, which is another uh, derivative method. Uh, so we can do that in the x. Uh, we can actually divide that into the x and the y direction. So that's what uh, these parameters here are. You know, Sobel x. This is uh, saying x derivative, but no y derivative. Uh, this is saying no x derivative, but yes on the y derivative. Or you can do it both ways. So execute that code. And assuming everybody has that in their directory, we can see the results. So here we have the original image. Uh, looks like a Sudoku puzzle from a newspaper. We see the Laplacian. Then we see uh, Sobel x. Uh, you can see that uh, the variations on the x, -ax the x dimension are uh, emphasized, whereas the y dimension, not so much. Well, really not at all. And uh, vice versa for Sobel y. So this is very useful uh, later on when you do like object detection, edge detection, and so forth. Uh, you, know, you want to actually get rid of the regions of uh, constant intensity, constant value. Uh, uh, just very useful in image processing and uh, computer vision in general. But uh, for edge detection, there actually are uh, algorithms dedicated to just that that are actually more sophisticated than simply you know, computing uh, derivatives. And one of the most useful ones is uh, the canny edge detector, which uh, you, I recommend reading about on uh, docs.opencv.org. Um, you know, like I said the first time, uh, you can use these functions without knowing the theory, but when you do know the theory, it is that much more useful. So, uh, you know, there's not nearly enough time to cover that in the lectures here, but uh, I'm just going to recommend that. So in this case, we're going to use the image of uh, the soccer player here. I don't know soccer, but I'm guessing that guy's famous. And 
the candy edge detector is super super easy to use cv2.candy your image and these are threshold levels so the 100 and 200 you know it depends on how sensitive or unsensitive you want to be so i don't know of any uh, magic formula for getting these numbers correctly a lot of times it's just empirical you have samples of uh, images that you want to do your edge detection on and then you'll find the values that you want so you can see here that uh, you know relatively flat regions. Uh, actually, I should mention, you know, when you do edge detection, unlike just high-pass filtering, high-pass filtering, you still get a continuum of values, whereas edge detection, the output is going to be binary, kind of is or isn't. Of course, with high-pass filtering, you can always do thresholding to binarize your image, and we're going to talk about thresholding shortly, but uh, that is a difference. But uh, yeah, this kind of edge detection, uh, we're going to use this again in the third session uh, when we talk about Huff transforms for uh, detecting curves and shapes in our images where you, know, you want to know whether or not you have an edge or not. So very easy to use. That's the point of this. So moving on, uh, morphological operations. You know, very often when you do uh, image analysis and computer vision, uh, you have masks that are binary, kind of your regions of interest, something where you've detected an object, and so forth. And uh, you, know, you want to do operations on these. You might want to extend it. You might want to contract it. You might want to do uh, subtraction, addition, uh, binary operations, and or so forth. But uh, very common operations uh, that I'm going to talk about here are going to be uh, erosion, dilation, and flood filling. So erosion, just kind of what, as the name implies, is kind of, you know, you have a binary image, and then we're just going to knock pixels off the outer edges of it. So I'm going to show an example here. We're just going to use a synthetic image that we're, uh, I'm going to create right here. So this mgrid function, it's a lot like ndgrid in MATLAB, where you create uh, an array of uh, you create an array of values in one dimension. So we want to go from negative one to one, but we want to create a two-dimensional image, uh, two-dimensional array of this uh, spread out, and we want to do that in both x and y. I don't think I'm being clear on that. So let's execute this. make this simple. We only want the first one. So I mean, let's say we want an uh, array of y values that's going to cover it. This way we can do operations on it. Uh, this will allow us to create that array then this dot t operator does the transpose of it, so we can do the same thing in x. So that's what these uh, first two commands are doing. So I realize that's kind of a quick explanation. Is that kind of clear to everybody? OK, great. So uh, I'm going to create this donut pattern here that we see here. So using these x and y values, first we create a z an array of zeros of the same size simply by multiplying the x coordinates by 0. Then we're going to create a circle just using the standard equation, x squared plus y squared is less than r squared. We're going to say that uh, in this annulus it equals 1, and in the inner annulus uh, it equals 0. So circle of 0.5, uh, you know, half is going to be uh, values of 1s, and then uh, in the inside it's going to be zeros. So let's try some of the different morphological operations. So again, we're going to create a kernel, which is similar to what we were doing before. So um, there are many different ways of doing this. Uh, it depends on what you want. Sometimes uh, you want to create a circular kernel. Uh, sometimes you want a square. Sometimes you want a cross. Uh, it depends on the shape that you're going for. So we create a 10 by 10 array of ones. And then we're going to erode it based on that. So what that does is it goes around the edges of the transition points, and then it knocks out this 10 by 10 array, this 10 by 10 grid. So we start off with the donut pattern, and then we have the eroded pattern, where you can see around the edges here and along the inside, we've expanded the black region and eroded the white region. Uh, like this is useful, like for example, let's say you're trying to segment out an object. We'll talk about image segmentation more in the next session. 
you might have a selection, but it might be too big. So you might want to, uh, you know, decrease the range of that selected region. So that's where, that's an example where you'd want to erode it. Or alternatively, you might be uh, wanting to get rid of some features, like, you know, you did uh, some sort of thresholding and you have some noise out here. Eroding it will actually knock out those features. And a uh, common operation is erosion followed by dilation, which is uh, a way of knocking out features but still preserving uh, the region of interest that you want. Dilation is just the opposite of that, where you're actually going to expand your region. So very similar. You know, it's almost the same uh, function calls. So you have your input, your kernel, a uh, number of iterations. This is in case you want to do it more than one time. So uh, in case you really want to dilate something or you really want to erode something, you can put uh, iterations to be some larger value. But yeah, dilations is going to uh, expand your uh, region of ones. So you can see, you can see here that you start off with this, and here we've expanded both inwards and outwards. So in case you want to expand your region of interest. Flood filling, uh, that's where you actually pick a region. Sometimes you just want to completely blank something out. So you pick a region. You know, we're going to specify, so I put the seed point to be 100, 100, which is the middle of the region. And then we're going to fill in all similar values around that with a value that we specify, which is uh, this uh, new val parameter right here. Uh, this only works on uh, this only works on 8-bit uh, images because uh, kind of like median blur uh, when you compare neighboring pixels uh, you want that quantization and uh, by default flood filling is going to try to uh, overwrite your original input image you remember from the first one that we passed by reference uh, we don't want to do that here for multiple reasons so hence we're going to take the circle image the donut image, convert it to 8-bit, and then we're going to make a copy of it so it doesn't try to overwrite our original image. So now we can see uh, the four images side by side. So I just filled this in right here. Uh, so uh, this can be useful for multiple things. I use it a lot for uh, centroid finding, but uh, this is just in case you want to uh, just completely knock out a region based on uh, similar values. Any questions there? Okay. Assume everybody is happy then. Well, I, yeah, I have a question. So. so how is it doing the edge detection to actually, uh, like what is it doing? Is it doing, it's doing some uh, edge detection and then it takes that edge detected image, convolves it with your kernel creates a mask and then uh, applies it's actually that, a lot simpler than that because here you know uh, the morphological <laughs> operations it's binary it's kind of zero or one so an edge is just anywhere where it makes that transition so there's no need for any uh, complicated edge detection does that make sense so i mean your edges are anywhere you know if i have a zero pixel and a one pixel yeah, sure, I get it in this example, but yeah. what happens if I apply this method to a more complicated image, like the um, Messier image? Don't do that. That's the short answer of it. I mean, the morphological operations are generally well-defined, so what you really want to do is, like, okay, I'm just doing this for simplicity where I'm showing these binary images, but what's going to happen you know, we're going to talk about things like image segmentation uh, more in the, next, uh, in the next session. But what's going to happen is you're going to have something where you divided up your image up into regions of interest. So your images are going to have uh, labels to them. Like each pixel is going to say, like, okay, this is region one, region two, or so forth. Or, you know, you've thresholded it out or something. Something that differentiates, you know, like if you have a picture of somebody's face or something with the background behind it, you can say, like, all of the face pixels are equal to one, whereas the background is all equal to zero. And that's where you want to do your morphological operations, not on just the raw face image itself, but on uh, something that's been uh, segmented or binarized somehow. Yeah, that's why I was asking, uh, like if you had some image, like the Messier image example, mm -hmm. you do your canary 
uh, application to that, you get an edge, and there you've essentially got an image of zero and ones, right? Because mm -hmm. now you have, and then you could apply this to that, and then that could create a mask, and then you could. You could. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, mean, get, I get what you're saying. Okay. So, everybody, we're all clear on this? Okay. Awesome. So moving on, this is uh, a very important, uh, something that comes up a lot is thresholding, hard thresholding versus adaptive thresholding. So, uh, you know, raw thresholding is very easy. You just say like everything below some value is equal to zero and everything above some value is equal to one. Uh, very intuitive, but that tends to cause a problem when you have images that are not uniformly illuminated. So, you know, you might have a checkerboard or something like that, or we're going to see the Sudoku puzzle uh, right below. Um, but, yeah, it tends to cause problems. So a uh, much more powerful way of doing this is adaptive thresholding, where you're actually doing statistics around a region of any given pixel. You compare something not to uh, just some hard fixed value, but to kind of an average value around the region. So this could be like you know, boxcar or Gaussian uh, weighted average. And then based on that, you can tell whether or not your pixel is supposed to be uh, black or white. So this, um, well, let's just take a look at this. You can see how much more powerful it is. So we have our original image, which has you know, varying degrees of light. And no matter what you choose for the threshold, you're not going to get good uh, values. You know, we can lower the threshold and then, you know, more of it will show up, but, uh, you know, more of it's going to be white than you want or vice versa. So there is no ideal value. But when you use adaptive thresholding, it's going to compare each pixel not to an absolute value, but again to some region around here. So we can see just how much more powerful that is, you know. We can actually read the numbers off of here. So uh, mean thresholding is a simple way where you just kind of have an average around it. Gaussian uh, does a weighted average, the Gaussian weighted, kind of just like with Gaussian uh, filtering. So uh, the method is uh, pretty easy to call, actually. So um, adaptive thresholding, let's just look at the Gaussian example. So you pass in the image, you pass in uh, the value that you want to replace it with. So we're dealing with unsigned 8-bit images again. So, uh, you know, the maximum value is 255. So anything that is deemed to be, uh, you know, passes the threshold is going to be set to a white pixel. Uh, CB2.adaptive thresh Gaussian C is just telling it that uh, we are going to uh, do the Gaussian threshold you know, as opposed to the mean threshold. And yeah, we want to binarize it, and uh, these are parameters that are going to depend on your application. So uh, yeah, there's no universal right answer to it. It's just something you kind of have to learn and experiment with. Any questions there? All right. All right, so we got 20 minutes left. So uh, what I wanted to cover was a little bit of uh, user interface development, which uh, is going to be you know, important for uh, image processing computer vision applications because ideally we would write programs that just you know, are super smart and automatically determine exactly what's wanted, but oftentimes you do have to play with parameters in order to get uh, you know, the desired output. So. Uh, briefly went through the convolution example, the deconvolution example from the last one where we looked at a uh, car's license plate and then uh, that was distorted by a motion blur. And then uh, we actually uh, enhanced it so that you could actually make out the license plate. So this code right here is a refactored version of uh, the code that comes with the OpenCV repository. So. Let's make sure we're in the correct directory. Actually, that shouldn't matter, but let's see what this does. So we have our distorted image of the car, and then we have what's known as our point spread function, which is kind of like if you were to take a picture of a point, and then you go through your distorting system, in this case motion blur, this is the image that you would get out. So. Um, yeah, this goes back to uh, convolution. So this would be the convolution of a point with your distorting function. 
So uh, hopefully that makes sense. If not, I can uh, give you some resources afterwards to learn about this. So the process of uh, deconvolution, we want to kind of undo that process, but take into account uh, the noise that's in the system. So you know, when you have something like this, it's impossible to perfectly determine exactly what was in the input, but you can get a uh, best estimate based on what you know. So uh, this is, in particular, is uh, the Wiener deconvolution method. So uh, you know, we're not going to go through every line of code, but uh, you know, the gist of it is we're going to do a Fourier transform. Uh, you know, we're going to uh, multiply transfer functions, perform uh, you know, the Wiener, uh, do like the Wiener transfer function based on that. Uh, I put a reference in here. Yeah, if you want to understand the theory better, I do recommend uh, this Wikipedia article. But anyway, so I'm going to show you what the correct answer is. So we only have a little bit of time, but do feel free to play with this. So if we know the angle of our motion blur and the extent of our motion blur, we can actually get back uh, this image uh, where you can actually make out the license plate number uh, based on that. I and mean, of course, it's still distorted, but uh, you know, again, that's the best you can do. But uh, the point of this is, uh, again, in user interface development. So uh, the key line here is uh, this interact function here. Oh, yeah, one more thing I want to mention. Uh, you know, before I did a PyLab notebook, but here we're doing PyLab inline because if you use widgets with the notebook, um, there's a little bit of uh, incompatibility because there are already a bunch of widgets. So uh, we did this line first. But this, what this interact function does, which comes from IPy widgets, which has a whole bunch of methods for functions for creating all kinds of uh, interactive tools, uh, very useful. Um, what this does is this, it's going to uh, allow you to uh, move these track bars here. And every time you do that, it's going to call a function. So we're actually calling a function, we're actually passing a function reference as a parameter. It's kind of known as functional programming. And then every time there's an update, like if I move this, it's going to call the update function with angle, you know, in this case 105, D equals 22, noise equals 25. So it calls this update function, then it's going to do the Wiener deconvolution, and it's going to display these images right here. Are there any questions on that? Everybody's silent, so I can't tell. Like, is this uh, intuitive or very confusing? That's not part of yeah. This, yeah, this is separate. This is with Python. So I'm going to talk about an OpenCV specific example uh, momentarily. Just you know, this is in case you're using the notebooks, which uh, I think makes it easier. Okay, well, I assume everybody's happy then. So you remember the inpaint example that uh, we ran before. This allows us to interactively create a mask, which we're going to fill in. So you can see here, this is the image that we've uh, marked up. And then this is an image where all these white spots are treated as a mask and are filled in with neighboring values. So uh, this example is a bit more complicated, but this, uh, this shows uh, OpenCV's native GUI functions. Actually, I want to stop here for uh, Mac or Linux users. Uh, since you guys did have uh, the issue before with uh, opening and closing windows, does this example work for you guys? It works. You just. Um can't close the window. Okay. Well, in this case, it's not my fault because this actually comes bundled with the OpenCV source code. So I, I have to admit, I'm surprised that uh, they didn't make it work on uh, Max. But I can try your edit that you suggested. Yeah, yeah. So I recommend opening this up with your favorite editor. So yeah.
So remember to call uh, OpenCV. So remember CV2.named window and CV2.start window thread, and hopefully that should fix it for you guys. But uh, yeah, this is a good example on how to use the tool. So um, Okay, in any case, uh, this uses uh, what they call the sketcher, which is uh, not officially part of OpenCV, but they did include it with the uh, Python examples here. So this allows you to uh, create a window that's going to allow you to draw on it. So uh, in the inpaint example, you know, the inpainting uh, call is actually fairly simple. You call cv2.inpaint, then IMG mark is, uh, you know, the image that you, uh, the input image uh, that uh, has whatever distortion as defined by your mark matrix, uh, which we define by uh, our keyboard input. This is uh, the amount of inpainting, the number of pixels, and uh, this is the inpainting method. So what this does is it calls a loop uh, that's going to go over and over again. And it's going to check to see, you know, 27 is the escape key. So if you do that, it should uh, break out. Uh, this is the spacebar key. So if you do that, it's actually going to perform the inpainting. And uh, R is uh, for reset. So this will reset it. So uh, the sketcher method right here is uh, what's going to actually allow you to get a mouse input. So um, there's a little bit of code there. I don't know how much time we have to go through it, but uh, I do recommend uh, studying that a bit, as well as uh, the deconvolution that we were showing before. This is a little bit simpler than the other one, uh, as it has uh, doesn't use the sketcher uh, technique, but this does uh, call the create track bar. So uh, you know, very similar to uh, the example I showed before. Maximize this. You need to have uh, what's known as a callback function, where uh, you know every time something happens, you're going to update it. So uh, the syntax is a little bit different for create track bar versus uh, you know the IPy widgets interact, but uh, very similar in order to get the parameters, and then uh, you know you'll do that update. I run this from here and so forth. This has it by default but does uh, much the same thing. So a lot of details here, but uh, probably the single most important is that you understand just how to get the keyboard input. So you know, every time you want to display something, you know, this wait key is a double purpose. It allows you to display and uh, you know, the return from that is whatever key the user hit. So uh, if you want to make an interactive application, you create a loop then uh, you do the wait key, see what happens, and then you test to see for value. So uh, you know, they just hard coded this 27 here, in, which is just the key for escape. So you hit escape, and then, uh, then it's going to break out of the loop and call destroy all windows. Actually, uh, that one I put in there myself, uh, just to do a clean cleanup if you execute it from the notebook. That's not in the original repository. Uh, but yeah, that will 
uh, ensure a clean output and then the space bar uh, they do here which uh, does some other stuff for this particular example. Could that key be different for Mac? Um, that wouldn't explain it because when you hit escape, it doesn't kill it. So I really don't think that that's the case. Really, like just any key should, or the escape key in any case, should kill it. That's what I'm saying. If the escape key on a Mac keyboard is in 27, then it won't call the break. Um, is that, where does that 27 come from? Does that come from within CD? No, no, no. This is a general keyboard. Like this was true, like you know, 30 years ago. Oh. That was the code. Yeah. That was the keyboard code for escape. Um, but the thing about your question is, uh, because in the examples we showed the first time when we did CV wait key, and then uh, you know we weren't even in a loop. So if you hit a button, then that should have just killed the window anyway, regardless of what key you hit. But it never showed the button on the map. Uh, oh, sorry, when I say button, I just mean a keyboard button. So. Uh, yeah, pauses for one millisecond. Um, well, it depends. Okay, so if you're doing it in a loop, uh, you can do that. If you want it just to hold indefinitely and wait for user input, then you want either zero or, you know, which is uh, the default if you leave it blank. So like if you're playing a video or something like that, or if you're running a loop uh, in an interactive loop, then you'd want to put in a value like one. So it just moves on after one millisecond. But, uh, you know, for uh, indefinite, uh, yeah, you'd want to leave it. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't so understand I did the question. A, I did a percent load deconvolution dot pi and then ran that so that it pulled the code up into the notebook, which you think, and then try to run it. And then it has a problem with the fact that the code is expecting some arguments to be passed through it. And we're not passing any arguments under the uh, there, okay, so there might be an issue if you tried, to, you copied and, let me make sure I understand the problem. You copied and pasted your code in? I used the magic key, percent load, space. Load? Yeah. Okay. Space deconvolution dot pi, and then ran that, and it brings the code into the cell. Right. When I run the cell, I can't get the same behavior that we have from the Python file. Uh, did you try percent side run deconvolution.py? Well, I wanted it to be in the code so I could read what you were reading and look at it. And now I just want to run it by shift enter. It Yeah, there's an issue with doing that. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly what it is, but you have to be careful, you know, whether you're executing something from a brand new Python session or within the notebook. So when you copy and paste like that, uh, I, I would recommend if you do want to execute something from an external file, uh, just use the percent run command and then you should get this right here. Okay, so the question is you want to pass arguments to some... Some subset of a notebook that you're working on. Mm -hmm. is, it, is there a way to define arguments and have them be defined like you do from the command line? Right. 
Uh, well, I'm not quite clear on what you mean. Do you mean like running from uh, an external script or? No, running from in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah. And you, know, you, you have some code that you copied in that's expecting some arguments to be passed. How would you tell Jupyter there are some arguments that need to go with the running of this code? Um, off the top of my head, I can think of several ways to do it. Um, you know, you might just define those arguments, like so it's expecting something called x. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're not going to call it like a function in this case. You're going to have a cell that's going to say x equals blank, y equals blank, and so forth. Once those variables are defined, then you should be able to execute your cell, and then those variables will be there. Alternatively, if you wrap your code in a function call, like def function x, y, whatever, then you can call it uh, just, you know, function parentheses here, uh, parameters. So, any other questions? On the, you jump back a few steps. Should we still have the microphone? Sorry. I forgot about the microphone. In the erosion and dilation example? Yep. The erode and dilate functions take the image um, and operate return of values where it looks like the flood fill, you have to create a new image. Uh, yeah, flood fill is, um, looking okay, so you're talking about this right here. Yeah, looking in the help, it wasn't obvious that one would have to do that. Uh, is there a way to know when, I, when it's going to interpret a pass by reference? Or? Um, when I looked at the documentation, I saw that uh, this one actually passes by reference and tries to modify in line. Though well, truth be told, the first time I ever called this function, it just did some funky stuff. So that was how I made that discovery. So um, yeah, I wish I knew like the end all answer to prevent all errors. But uh, in this case, you know, I discovered this simply by running okay. it and then uh, figuring out uh, what needed to be done. Okay. Hopefully that's a satisfying answer. Actually, that does bring me to uh, one other thing I did not mention before, is that the result from flood fill is not exactly the same as the result from uh, erosion and dilation in that, like, it actually, flood fill gives another parameter, which is the number of flood fill pixels, and then it gives the image. So that's why I call flood fills uh, in brackets one. Uh, because I just want the actual image that's returned, and then I convert it to float 32 to be consistent with the rest of my examples. Okay. So I know that wasn't part of your question, but still relevant. So uh, it's 1.30, so I think that's all the time we have uh, for today. If there are any other questions, uh, I will uh, be happy to try to answer them for you, and uh, by all means, uh, feel free to email me. So uh, thank you, and uh, hope to see you next time where we're going to talk about some exciting stuff, uh, image segmentation, feature finding, uh, image registration. Uh, should be uh, interesting. Thank you.